Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker. And I want, you, want to take you on a journey back and think back 40-ish years and think about just a couple of highlights probably all of you remember right? as we go through languages, as we go through very early machines, as we go through concepts that have made their imprint in our, in our industry. Uh, we're talking about a fellow of the ACM, a recipient of the ACM Turing Award. Not sure whether you recognize this person, but maybe you recognize that person. So it's a pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Wirt to share with us some insights or an overview of the history of the last time, how we got here. Uh, I'm sure it will be a very interesting opening hour. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, in all, spite of all this very nice introduction, you might be surprised to see me here as a speaker. Uh, and I'm myself actually surprised, and I wonder why I'm here. Uh, I got some time ago asked whether I would like to come down, down that means to the other side of the town, uh, to give a talk. And I said, well, uh, why not? And uh, now I'm surprised to see myself as a speaker, not in a little group, but on a, on a conference. Anyway, bear with me. Uh, of course, I must confess that I'm not an expert in program testing. And so I hope you don't expect big news and technical breakthroughs about program testing from me. So what I'd rather do is give you perhaps some perspective on history of programming and program testing, which are intimately intertwined. And uh, perhaps see a bit through the development over the last uh, five decades in this subject. Yes, I first got in touch with the field of programming in 1959, as a matter of fact. I had emigrated to Canada and by chance ended up in a just founded graduate department. We were five students, one from France and one from Brazil, one from Pakistan, one from China and one from Switzerland. And uh, I got a master's degree there and uh, attended a course in uh, numerical analysis. And that was kind of attractive because they had a computer and one would do the exercises with the aid of this computer, an ALWAC. It turned out, however, well, big thing, big, huge thing. It turned out that whenever we had finished an exercise, programmed an exercise, wrote the program, uh, the computer was in service, in maintenance. It was down, as people say now. So you ended up this whole course without a single, single, without once even touching the machine. And so there were no failing grades. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a letdown in spite of it all, but never mind. Then I moved on to Berkeley, uh, where I entered a PhD program that was in 1960. And uh, with one eye, I looked whether there were any openings, assistantships in the computer-related area. And after a while, one turned up. And I got in touch with Appendix G15 machine. Uh, it was also like the uh, like a drum machine. That means the main program, uh, the, the data were on a drum. Uh, arranged in tracks of, I think, 128 words at 27 bits or something like that. And, um, and there I really got uh, into programming. Programming, of course, in hexadecimal machine code and uh, online. You had to reserve an hour or whatever on that machine for yourself. Could do that maybe once or twice or three times a week. And there you struggled to get simple, very simple programs uh, 
running. So testing was already more predominant than programming. Uh, the main debugging tool was a bell. That means when your program finished or somehow uh, trapped or whatever, you had to uh, insert, uh, uh, use a, a command, ring bell. Very important command. So that was debugging in 1960. Well, uh, the computation center had a, a bigger machine, an IBM 704, six uh, 32,000 words of store, and uh, and that machine was programmed remotely. That means you never touched the machine, you never even saw it. You punched. Uh, your program on punched cards and inserted them at, uh, at a desk, a place where a tray, and uh, either eight or 24 hours later, you could go and see whether the output was ready. So how was debugging done there? Uh, I, I, I forgot. Uh, but somehow, uh, you had to inspect if the results didn't come out right, you had to produce octal dumps. That means uh, images of the core, uh, of, of the memory, which was called core because it consisted of magnetic cores. And, uh, and then you had to weed through these uh, myriads of octal numbers. Of course, the computer wasn't that big. Um, it was, as I said, at most 32,000 words of store, and your program occupied only a small part of it. We weren't in the age of gigabytes already, so how would uh, octal dumps look nowadays? You can imagine. Well, there were two things, of course. Uh, one is that programming and debugging took a lot of time. Turnaround time was the key issue. If uh, you made a, a mistake, a small mistake, you essentially spent another day waiting or programming, I don't know. So, in a way, a very important innovation in that time was a programming language. At that time, it was Fortran, and then it was just the advent of ALGOL 60. Fortran uh, is a very, at, at least at that time, was a simple language. And what could even imagine how uh, statements were re uh, translated into uh, machine instructions? So, first milestone of the ones I'm going to discuss was the introduction of a high-level programming language. Of course, this brought me into the field of compiler design for various reasons. But I discovered that there was uh, a group in one corner of the computer science or computer center building who programmed on something that's now called a compiler. And the challenging thing is that the whole compiler program was formulated in the language that was translated itself. So kind of a recursive situation. And I joined that group and managed to convince my professor that this was something worthwhile studying. And uh, after a while, I got into the, got to an, to some understanding of what was going on. Uh, it was, it was simply a true mess. There was only one person who had what one might call some understanding of the whole thing. And if anything you wanted to do, you had to go and consult with her and bother her. It was a program maybe uh, 100 pages long, which was awfully long at that time, and uh, full of algol statements 
intertwined, mixed up with machine code instructions, MCH in an inoperable number. So the advantage of using a high-level language was rather marginal. And then, of course, comes the question of how do you debug? Uh, well, again, the famous or infamous optical dump comes to question again, apart from certainly uh, manipulating your program, inserting a, a additional print statement, deal and bail, and so on, which even nowadays is actually not a bad way. Uh, but the key is you have to know how this compiler worked, how it translated into machine code, because it was just, the compiler was a step between you and the program running, but there was no feedback. You, in order to know what was going on, you had to talk in the, or, or understand the machine code and, and, and the machine operations, and tediously find how far the program had progressed and where it got stuck, where an error occurred. No wonder that uh, debugging and testing, which is intimately connected, um, testing is debugging until it runs. Uh, this was a very tedious process, and you had to learn to think in the machine, not in terms of the machine, not only in terms of the programming language. I will come back to this, to this topic. The, uh, well, as I said, I got into this field of compiler design. I was uh, sure that one of the primary um, duties in computer science, the one thing that might bring us a step ahead, would be to bring some order into the chaotic mess. Perhaps try to find a good principle according to which a compiler could be written, so that you could systematically build it up from scratch. Of course, this had all to do with syntax analysis, a field uh, very much active in the 1960s. Syntax analysis made it possible to specify, or syntax must made it possible to specify rigorously what the language was, what were acceptable sentences and which ones were not. Now, to de describe the meaning of an admissible sentence is still another thing. That's a, a definition of, of semantics, and we didn't get very far in that subject. Anyway, uh, subsequent compilers, which I wrote for first for ALGO, then for ALGO W, the derivative of, of ALGO 60, were a lot, lot, lot more systematically built uh, than the one for this NILIAC. And they could be explained, people could be introduced rather quickly. But so what? I mean, debugging still was a topic at hand. And nevertheless, the systematic high-level language allowed to uh, make one progress, and I consider it quite a milestone nowadays, namely symbolic debugging. That means you did, it replaced uh, the necessity of uh, understanding the translation in, and the outcome of it in terms of the machine architecture uh, by letting you think in terms of the high level language only, at least ideally it should be that way. That means you could get, uh, in the case of failure of your program, you could obtain uh, a state of the computation, not in terms of things pertinent to the machine, octal hexadecimal dump, and location, PC location where it failed. In, instead, you could get uh, the state of the point of failure in terms of your program. You could get a list of the variables active at this moment and their values 
in des as decimal numbers or character strings or Boolean values. And this was, as I would say, uh, quite a breakthrough because it relieved the programmer from knowing anything behind the scene of the language, of the high-level language. Nevertheless, let's go back to the topic of testing. Let's assume that you got through your debugging aids the impression that your program was correct. How did you make sure that it was indeed correct instead of having only belief? Or how do you convince other people that it is correct? is free of, of mistakes. Well, that is, of course, uh, a key question, uh, which was important then and I think is important now. This is certainly something I ought not to tell you who are in the field of testing. I mean, it's all a business of convincing other people that your product is right. Uh, well, Of course, uh, there is the idea that you test all possible cases. At least that was an idea. And it's, it's a failure. It's, it's a misconception. It was Dijkstra who uh, pointed this out, that even very, very simple computation cannot be tested exhaustively. And the... Uh, the uh, example he gave was that of, actually he said multiplying, doesn't matter, adding two 32-bit numbers. Now, in this case, you have, um, you have two to the 64 possible cases that you ought to test. Now, let's assume that you want to, you are so naive, you try to test all the 2 to the 64 cases of additions. And that every test will occupy, will take one microsecond. Perhaps nowadays I should say one picosecond or whatever. Never mind. Let's assume one microsecond. Then you have... 2 to the 64, that's about 10 to the 21, about. And you have 10 to the 21 cases divide by the number of, seconds, of microseconds you have per year. And you decide, divide this by this number, and you get something like 10 to 10 years uh, to do all the test cases. <laughs> it, it may be not 10 to the 10, it may be something 10 to the eight or something like that, yes. Which is still more than we, we could care to wait for. Uh, and uh, just the point is that it's uh, obviously mistaken to try exhaustive testing, even for very simple cases. Now, the programs we use nowadays are very, very complex. And obviously, we must find some method of obtaining the necessary conviction of correctness by some other means. Uh, there are two ways to do that. And uh, one would, of course, be to reduce the number of test cases. And the other would be to use faster computers. And I'm afraid uh, the world at large, uh, well, certainly takes a mixture of both, but very heavily relies on the increased power of computers. Uh, it's certainly not the academic way. And I think we are at the place where we can say we are still in misery. And even the fastest computers for testing cannot really do the job properly if the programming wasn't done in the first place right. The ideal would, of course, be to have 
not so and so many test cases, but zero test cases. Uh, I, I would like to remind you of uh, what, what Dijkstra said back in 1970 about that testing is at best capable of showing the existence of errors, but never to prove their absence. Now, in a way, this is the test certificate for testing, or test sentence. And uh, I don't think you should be very happy about this. And therefore, I also um, hesitate to show you this sentence. But it is so true that I cannot uh, withhold it from you. So the goal must be a dramatic uh, reduction of the test cases. Make it at all uh, feasible. Now, the best way is, of course, to go to be radical and to reduce the number to zero. And uh, the way uh, that of doing that is called analytic testing, analytic program analysis, or program verification, if you want. Now, this is certainly a field that has undergone very much research activities, mostly at universities, and is still being actively pursued. Uh, and you might wonder why it is not more widely applied and why it hasn't been much more successful than it has so far been. First of all, it's not easy. Uh, you need uh, quite the capability of mathematical thinking, of proving essentially what Dijkstra already has shown, that is programming is an activity very close to pro mathematical proving. And not everybody is very much trained at this. And uh, so we shouldn't expect that we could... Uh, get thousands and tens of thousands of programmers to be brilliant mathematical provers. So that's one thing of the side, uh, the, the human factor. And the other is, of course, that when you want to prove something, you have to have a sound basis from which you can start your proofs by applying uh, a whole sequence of deductions. So the deduction rules must be very precisely defined and the basis on which you rest, your, 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 your universe rests. Now, the ba what is the basis? We prove programs uh, which are texts, texts written in a certain language. And in order to do anything rigorous about such programs, your language must be rigorously defined. As a matter of fact, people look at the programming language as something you jot down programs and then you feed it to the computer. But actually, a good programming language is for human consumption. It should be a tool in which you precisely formulate your programs, which are then subjected to mathematical reasoning. That, that's the same. That's already said in the 1970s. Dijkstra was a very strong proponent of all this. But it, he hits the key of the matter. A programming language must be rigorously defined, and you must be able to do mathematical reasoning with its text. And if you look at nowadays programming languages, they are further from that goal than they were uh, 50 years ago. I would rather have mathematical reasoning conducted on algo programs than on C programs or name it, you name it, PL1, Java, whatever. Our languages have become so huge so complicated that it 
there is no hope to ever put them into a rigorous mathematical framework as a whole. And furthermore, programming has changed. It's not just concocting programs in that language according to given rules. You essentially rely very heavily on library routines. And most of your time is actually spent in finding the right library routines and understanding them. So I'm afraid I'm actually drawing a fairly negative uh, picture of our so-called science and testing uh, that's a conclusion we can safely draw testing is going to stay with us forever um, maybe that's a satisfaction for you uh, it's not a very brilliant uh, uh, recommendation for academia in computer science and I don't hesitate. I actually think they failed pretty badly. And I don't even have to go to prehistory uh, to make this point. Prehistory, uh, well, I, ha I, I think that the era of computing started around 1975 with the advent of the personal computers particularly Alto in the Xerox lab, which brought computing into homes and into schools out of these very few closed uh, compute computation centers inhabited by the so-called specialists. So everything that I'm, I was telling you about pre-1975 is prehistory prehistoric events. We should consider high-level programming languages as formal systems. It's not only the users which con should conceive them, consider them as such, but the designers. High-level languages must be rigorously defined, as I said, and the point is without reference to any underlying mechanism for their interpretation. Because if you do not satisfy this requirement, any programmer who finds his program in mistake or, 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 or any tester must obviously also know about the underlying computer. He cannot just rely on the definition, on the rules of the language. Now, it's always said that these languages are high level. What does that mean? I think that just means on a higher level of abstraction. Abstraction means that you can forget about certain things, and in this case, about the structure and the instruction set and so on of the underlying computer. And you should be able to use a language on this or that computer and should always behave equally well. And if you do not deliver a definition of the language without reference of that computer, then you are in bad shape. I have struggled, I think, all my life creating a language that would be uh, explainable without reference to a computer. And my first one, Euler, you mentioned, but Algo W and then Pascal, uh, had, I had this in mind, but of course I failed. I had to produce a language in due time that was usable for me and for our students. So I couldn't wait until I had found uh, the ultimate solution. Pascal had failed. There are certain things where you had to uh, know the understa underlying machine to understand mistakes. Then came Modula and then Oberon. And each time, I think in this, uh, with, towards this goal, there was a definite progress made. In Modula, the idea of the encapsulation 
was brought in. Very important. I think I mentioned that even in the milestones. Modules and encapsulation, that was in 1980. In ADA, they were then afterwards called packages. ADA was quite a bit influenced by um, Tite to say, not only by Pascal, but by Modular. Uh, encapsulation and module concept are important insofar as it was guaranteed that mistakes uh, occurring at one place uh, could be analyzed by just looking at its immediate environment. And you could exclude objects or variables defined, procedures defined in other modules, in other parts. So instead of having uh, the whole world uh, to analyze, you could restrict your scope to a certain module. Already a very big, uh, big progress of which people are even nowadays making use. That was certainly a great help of reducing the number of cases to analyze. Of course, uh, as I said, uh, it would be ideal to reduce the test cases to zero. That means by uh, using strict mathematical analysis. And for that, you need the axiomatic definition as a basis for proving program correctness. I'm afraid uh, this idea had come up uh, about 40, no, 30 well, no, 40 years ago, between 30 and 40 years ago. And uh, a lot of activity started immediately about pro proving program's correctness by analytical methods. Not very, very much has happened so far, I'm afraid, uh, at least not in practice. Industry practically ignores all these uh, efforts. And I can also understand why, because practitioners, industry, have to deal with the systems available at large. And they are huge. And they are not built with these methods at the first place. And if you build a house, you can prove its stability as long as you want if you don't know how stable uh, the, the ground is, uh, you, you, you don't get very far. If you build on sand, it's not as if you build on rock. And whatever you prove about the house must cannot be better than what the, the, the ground uh, uh, promises. Well, here, of course, we come to a topic that I uh, is very much close to my heart. The, the problem is in the complexity of our systems. And we should strive every day when we program to reduce or to, to, to keep the complexity within manageable bounds. But we are uh, in the bad position that, of course, whatever we build is built on, on many, many other systems that are hundreds or thousand times more complex than what we build. And so we can only promise anything uh, with the uh, reservation that the environment holds to the promises. Uh, in a way, we, we are very much uh, uh, victims of our own love and boundless exercising of creating more and more complexity. Uh, a telling tale are, of course, the programming languages, which have become more and more complex. And they are programming libraries, which have become huge and ever become huger. And uh, there are given specifications, but they are typically not complete.
Yes, I have uh, talked about the past. And let me add at least five minutes to talk about the present. I have, uh, I'm out of this world of uh, huge programming systems, by and large. But I'm still participating in one project and have to program myself. I program uh, software in the language of our own making, this Oberon. And it is really a pleasure, because there one understands what's going on. Of course, having built it myself mostly, I should understand. So this is one thing. The other thing is that I'm in the same project uh, designing hardware, uh, essentially uh, a set of identical processors connected by a network. Um, and all this is done on a programmable device, an FPGA. And there, of course, nowadays, you do not, uh, as you did 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, draw circuit diagrams proving the correctness of the circuit. How did you ever do that? But it's an unknown concept. No, nowadays you don't draw circuit diagrams anymore. You describe them in terms of what? Of a circuit description language, which is also called programming language. Uh, the one I'm using is called Verilog, uh, commercial product. Uh, first of all, it's also a language which is hugely complex. And it has one excuse, namely that it has to introduce software concepts into hardware. And sometimes you don't know whether to describe a sequential program because the statements look very much like that. But then you realize again that you're actually describing a circuit where all the gates uh, operate at the same time parallel. So we are even further away than we are when we use C or C++ or C sharp from any kind of sound theoretical basis which would allow program proving. But then uh, uh, this language is also surrounded by a lot of tools and they are the real misery start. I'm really struggling in finding my way through these tools. And often the concepts are not clear and the connections are not clear. And sometimes I just don't know whether there is a bug in the tools or in the bug in my thinking. Narrowing down, of course, is uh, the, the mistake is a primary principle in finding mistakes. And sometimes you just stare at the place and you think it must be right what I'm writing. And then you call for an expert and after a few days they find out that this and this was the reason something had been missing a completely different place of the system or of the tool set or of the configuration specification, or, 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 and configuration files and all kinds of things where something might go wrong and which are, of course, not described in this very log. Mm -hmm. So understanding very log is by far not enough. You must understand a lot more inclusive, inclusive down to the levels of gates. So, if you are unhappy with the tools of your software world, then I order you to dive into the hardware world for a few days, and you'll come back happily. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, I sometimes feel uh, this is such a highly praised field, information technology or computer science, and I sometimes wonder, where is actually the progress that we have made? We are still struggling uh, with similar problems as we did 50 years ago. I told you we had these sign-up times. 
And we had long, long compilation times, even for small programs. Well, my hardware program is also only a few pages long. And when I compile it, I have to wait half an hour. And then I spend an hour finding what went wrong. If I'm lucky, I find it out. Usually I do not, but I get some idea what might be a possible remedy. I make one or two little changes, and then I wait another half hour. Reminds me totally of the times of the 60s. There at least I had the time to go home, not only to drink a cup of coffee. But still, it's the same basic problems that we are fighting with, and it, it shouldn't be that way. I believe we could increase the productivity of our engineers by a factor of 100 and more if we had proper tools. Now, our dilemma is, of course, that we are stuck with the tools. Also, the huge companies who produce these tools are stuck. And sometimes they admit that they are suffering most. I don't know a way out. I don't know. Don't expect uh, that I have a, a, a panacea uh, to get out of this situation. We have moved far too deeply to trace back. Too bad. I'm uh, reluctant to leave you with such a bad, bad note. But uh, before we start a discussion, and I, 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 uh, I have a bulletproof vest, by the way, so don't <laughs> bother. Um, let me leave you with, with a few, perhaps a bit more positive thoughts. Whereas we acknowledge that testing is, indis is indispensable, strong efforts must be made to eliminate errors in the first place instead of detecting, avoid errors. This, of course, means that testing and programming must be intimately intertwined. They shouldn't be separate activities. I mean, we have seen now already that in order to reduce this enormous number of testing cases, you have to know the structure of your program. You have to know how it was developed. And then you can test border cases only and rely on things in between, seeing, hopefully seeing that there's a linear or whatever behavior between the two the borders. If the, if the array is, is 100, has 100 element, if you test for zero element and for 99th element, you can safely assume that in between it will probably work at all. So you cannot separate testing from development. Now, whereas analytic methods are needed, they are neither easy nor infallible. I'd like to put stress on that too, because program proving is a very subtle business. It needs only it needs very good logical skills, and since systems are huge, we have a tendency to automate them, like testing. If something is too big to understand, let's automate it. And computers are fast enough nowadays, so we'll manage somehow. Whether this, uh, of course, uh, increases the trustworthiness is another question. But it's not infallible, and proofs can also contain errors. So you may make an error in proving an error erroneous system and this leading to the belief that the whole thing is correct. More effective, because available now, would be simpler, less baroque languages, less baroque formal systems, together with, with a disciplined approach to program design. I think programming is 
No, I don't think. I know it is so. Programming is at the basis, at the root of the whole matter. And it's not given proper attention. This may be a strong statement, but it is true. At universities, programming is, is, uh, is neglected. The skill, teaching the skill of programming is neglected. Because it's difficult and it's considered mm, below the uh, rank of academic activities. I mean, programming, you assume by osmosis somehow. You are a clever fellow, you can strike this together. And this is not so. For the simple things, yes. But as soon as things become more complex, it's not. Tony Hoare once said we should uh, look at programming like learning to play the piano. You very quickly learn to play the first simple tunes with two fingers. But in order to become a master, you must learn it to play with ten fingers. And uh, very often we quickly are trained to, or not trained, we are asked to learn playing by two fingers. And then later on, the difficulties are over overwhelming. Universities are not very good places to learn programming. There are no professors who teach programming because they don't program themselves anymore. That's why I'm not familiar with the difficulties which are also present in the languages and the systems they choose. And then they leave the trouble to their assistants. Yes, um, what can we do? I don't know. Maybe you have a solution. Uh, that is really what I wanted to say, and I hope we can have a few questions now. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>